Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We also have a number of people uh, online as well. I want to welcome you. Uh, my name is Gregory Sisk, and I, along with Monsignor Martin Schlag, am the co-director of the Murphy Institute on in Catholic Thought, Law, and Public Policy. Uh, for lawyers who are wishing to get one hour of CLE credit, please uh, uh, sign in with your attorney number outside. And if you are online, you can email your ID number to murphyinstit at stthomas.edu. Uh, and everyone should know that this program is being recorded uh, and will later be placed on the Murphy Institute website. So this is another in our continuing series of Hot Topics Cool Talk. Uh, my director, Michelle Rash, and others have noted that in recent uh, weeks, I've mistakenly referred to this as Hot Topics Cool Thoughts. Uh, it is, in fact, cool talk, not cool thoughts. Uh, at the risk of levity, I might suggest cool thoughts are what you have after you have used recreational marijuana. Uh, but what we're going to be doing today is engaging in cool talk. Um, our mission is to invite those who have strong views on controversial topics uh, to have a civil conversation about it. Uh, we want to model for uh, our society uh, that uh, there are better ways, healthier ways to engage in discussion of controversial topics than our too often very divided society. Uh, and this is one of those examples. The Minnesota legislature right now is considering legislation to not only decriminalize marijuana, but to legalize it for recreational use and commercial production. Now, when we last had a Hot Topics Cool Talk uh, session last fall on qualified immunity, and I spoke as the advocate against qualified immunity, I said that the Catholic position on qualified immunity was that there was no Catholic position on qualified immunity. Uh, that's not the case today. The Minnesota Catholic Conference, uh, while open to decriminalization, is opposed to legalizing recreational marijuana use. Uh, the church fears that creating a commercial marijuana industry uh, will result in increased use of this intoxicating substance by uh, minors and those with mental health problems and be harmful to the most vulnerable. So some who are familiar with other things that the Murphy Institute does might wonder, so why are we having this conversation when the church has a position on the issue? I think that's precisely when we should have this kind of a conversation in a hot topics, cool talk discussion. When the church intervenes on a matter of public policy as it does through the Minnesota Catholic Conference, uh, it is relying on publicly accessible reasoning for what it believes is the common good. By definition, that means making reasoned arguments and listening to reasoned responsive arguments. It means participating in civil society and in conversation. Moreover, we believe that when we engage in that kind of a civil discussion, we will learn more about each other and we may find that even if we cannot reach complete consensus, we will find places of common ground. And so today we will hear from two distinguished participants in this public discussion. I will introduce Representative Hansen now and ask her to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. Then I will separately introduce Dr. Rilmuto uh, to do the same. So Representative Jessica Hansen represents House District 55 in Savage and Northwest uh, Burnsville. She has a BS in social work from St. Catherine University, did her senior internship at the Interprofessional Center for uh, Counseling and Legal Services right here at the University of St. Thomas, and is finishing her master's in advocacy and political leadership at Metro State University. She grew up in poverty, was a high school dropout, and became a teen mom and is now a single mother with two children. Before election to the legislature, she was involved with grassroots advocacy for the legalization of cannabis, including being the pro bono director of a coalition of 10,000 people. And now she is the number two author on the proposed legislation. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me here today. It really is an honor to be back on campus again. Um, I left academia to run for politics and needless to say, I miss it. Um, and so being in front of you today is really an honor and I just appreciate you taking the time to hear about what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing in St. Paul around cannabis legalization. 
Um, so as was said, my name is Jess Hansen. I represent District 55A down in Savage in Northwest Burnsville. I wasn't supposed to become a politician, but here I am today. I'm a regular person with a cool job and a lot of power and knowledge to share with the rest of the folks in our state and to continue to make Minnesota the best place to live, work, and raise a family. And when I finished my undergraduate degree, I knew I wanted to get involved in justice initiatives. And one of the things that I was looking at was the war on drugs. Uh, growing up in poverty, I saw disproportionately how people I loved and people I knew were being harmed by um, whether it was over policing or just drug war um, antics in general. And when I saw the people in my life that were affected, I noticed that the people who were most harmed and were having the most problems didn't look like me. Um, and I wanted to make sure I did my part to make sure we could fight to uh, end some of the racial discrimination we have in our state. So what I did was I looked at what are we doing on cannabis legalization, who's affected and why is it illegal right now? And most of the conversation I'll have with you today is not to convince you to like weed, it's not to convince you to consume weed or encourage anybody else to. My arguments are strictly around the fact that prohibition is a failed system. Cannabis prohibition has failed Minnesotans hand over foot in a number of different arenas from public health to public safety to um, youth education and more. And so the first point that I want to start with is to really go back to the roots of prohibition and why was it put in place in the first in the first place. Uh, my argument is that it is a very racist system and it was intentionally built to be one. Um, when Harry Anslinger initially pushed forward to make cannabis illegal in this country, he did it for very intentional reasons. The, the documentary called Reefer Madness, if you've ever watched that or heard of that, is laden with excessively racist uh, material, tropes, and some of the most violent language and perspectives that we've heard any government official say on record with no shame. And so I always caution folks, if you're going to look back at what he said about our Black and Latinx uh, citizens and friends in this country, please do so with a, a veil of self-care because it's very harmful and hurtful. And we should be rooted in the fact that that was his initial reasoning for wanting to do this. Um, he said things that I, I won't go into some of the blatantly racist things that he said, because I would never repeat that. But some of the things he said was that you know, if you if you consume cannabis, it'll make you want to have sex with your brother. We there's no reason to believe that that's to be true, but those were some of the lines and thinking that he used. His implement in his, the reason that he began referring to this as marijuana was not because that's what the plant is called. The plant is called cannabis, and the word marijuana had a Mexican or Latino sounding word to it. And there's a very intentional piece he wrote about why he wanted to call it that to make sure he could aim the blame at certain communities. The other important thing to understand is that this prohibition was put in place very clearly 40 years after and upheld um, intentionally to oppress black and brown communities. Um, we heard from um, John Ehrlichman, who was one of Nixon's aides. He said, we can't make it illegal to be black or against the war, but if we criminalize both heavily, we can disrupt and dismantle those communities. So if that's not an admission of what the intentions of cannabis prohibition were, I don't know what are. We know that cannabis prohibition has been ineffective. In addition to being one of the most racist systems we have and a, a tentacle of white supremacy, it's ineffective for a number of reasons. Americans and Minnesotans are told that cannabis is illegal because it is, it is to protect kids. It's to protect public safety. It's to protect people. I'm here to tell you that if you talk to anybody under the age of 18, 21, they will tell you that they can make one phone call, send one Snapchat message, and they can get cannabis. Currently, children have more access to cannabis than ever before. So if we're really wanting to make sure we can protect kids from consuming or getting their hands on something before their brains are ready to responsibly consume something that affects their brains and bodies, then we need to understand that that's our reality before us today. When people talk about road safety, we say that cannabis is illegal to keep our roads safe. I'm here to tell you, people are driving high today. You have people operating heavy machinery, you have people in hospitals, you have people in a lot of professions, including in politics, who are making decisions for people under the influence of cannabis. It's already happening. If the sky were going to fall as a result of people using cannabis, I think we would all be in trouble right now. 
Additionally, we talk about product quality. The cannabis that's coming into Minnesota right now is oftentimes the products that are rejected from other legal states. Cannabis is inspected for a variety of things. For example, mold, mites, any other kind of uh, pest infections <laughs> um, and pesticide residue. That's not happening in cannabis that we have today. Um, when those states reject that, there's a large amount of cannabis that needs to end up somewhere. And more often than not, it ends up here. If you recall in Southern Minnesota, there was an, uh, an incident where some youth were consuming vape cartridges that had vitamin E oil in them and it permanently damaged their lungs. And this is the result of an unregulated market. That product quality has a huge impact on how we um, regulate what is in our state. There's currently no limits on the THC potency or how it's grown or any of that right now. And so it's our argument that a, a regulated market is a safe market. A market that's operating outside of the light of day is dangerous. Drug dealers don't check IDs. Nobody's checking to make sure. We have children entering the, the school to prison pipeline because they have cannabis at school. Children are consuming cannabis and other, uh, other drugs without being taught about what it does to their body, their minds, or how to safely use those things if there is such a thing, which is a different argument. It's my argument that cannabis prohibition has done more harm than good. And because of that, we need to face that reality ahead of us. Again, this is not to convince anybody to light cannabis or to light up a joint on a Friday night. This is to help us ground in the fact that our tax dollars are being wasted on an ineffective system. There's a lot of um, talk about whether or not police departments or judicial systems are charging this equitably across the state you'll find that um, in rural Minnesota, there's higher enforcement rates and those enforcement rates are disproportionately upon the bodies of black and brown people. In Minnesota overall, it's approximately eight times more likely that a black man will be charged with a cannabis crime than a white man. Cannabis was decriminalized in Minnesota in the 1970s up to one ounce, but yet we still see these disparities existing today. I went to St. Kate's as I was told here today. Um, and so a lot of my education and the policy advocacy I do today is grounded in Catholic social justice principles. And I have taken a lot of time to make sure that what we do around this work centers around the common good, that it centers around making sure we are encouraging people to participate in society fully, that we're respecting their inherent dignity and worth, that we are taking the time to understand there are vulnerable people being in, improperly affected by this, and we can do something about it. So when we look at some of the, the goals that we have or the principles we have in social justice principles, we have to understand that the life and human dignity of people are being harmed. And for us to stay on the sidelines and know that that's happening to, my, to me is irresponsible. So as we look forward at what cannabis legalization looks like in the legislature, we're focusing on very clear priorities. Our program and our market will be the best, best industry this country has ever seen because people like me and other grassroots organizers have taken the time to talk to other states, to talk to other grassroots organizers in other states to figure out what's failed and what's working. We know certain things in public policy such as local control or um, tax rates can affect how effectively we can shut down the underground market. And so we actually are, are also kind of reframing how we talk about this. We insisted on calling this cannabis, calling it by the name that the plant is. We insist on calling this an adult personal use industry because it's not just recreational for a lot of the people who consume cannabis. We insist on making sure that this is founded very firmly in racial justice, that we work to expunge the records that we have put on people, that we work to right the wrongs of our past. We're looking to make sure that we're standing in solidarity and using intersectional theories and liberation theories to understand that as long as prohibition exists, none of us are reaping the benefits of what this legacy market could really offer to Minnesota. Um, you know, when we think about what does it look like to actually build a market, we want to keep that tax rate low so that we can encourage people in what we're calling the legacy market to come into a legal market to be able to profit. The government has profited on the war on drugs for generations, and it's important that we understand cannabis has been around for thousands of years in, in, and has been used by humans dating all the way back to um, 
Egyptian times. We have found cannabis in tombs and, and many more things. We know it was a commonly used um, uh, plant um, before prohibition went into place, that there are benefits that help people. And we want to make sure that we provide pathways for people once we end prohibition to come into this legal market, knowing that a regulated market is a safe market. Any unregulated product is going to continue to cause us harm. So I think I'm at my time. I'm at about 10 minutes here. Um, okay, I can go a little longer. Tell the politician she can go longer and she'll go longer. Um, <laughs> So I th some of the other things we're hearing about in the legislature that I think are, are valid arguments that we have to be sure that we address. There's a common um, argument that cannabis legalization leads to more high driving and that there's supposedly statistics from other states to reflect that. But then in the same breath, they'll tell me, well, we can't legalize it because we don't have any way to test for it. So how do we know that it's going up if we don't have any ways to test for it, right? And so it's important that we continue to de develop those. We can't do that while it's illegal though. And so in the work that I'm doing, I'm making sure that we make very clear investments in public health to make sure we invest in the U of M's School of Public Health and to create a center for drug policy and research so that we can lead this country in doing quality research that Minnesota has already been known for and we can continue to invest in that. Um, we're also making sure that we have a social equity model built into our program, that we have social equity applicants very defined in state law that helps us understand when we start issuing licenses, how do we equitably issue them? How do we make sure we lend a hand back to the people that we put into the criminal justice system? That's the right thing to do. We want to make sure we're making investments through grant programs for people who want to get into, the, into this um, industry. We know that access to social capital and financial capital is a privilege that not everybody has. And if we're serious about making sure we are standing with the common good and doing the right thing, then it's important we make those investments. I'm the vice chair of economic development and those decisions run directly through my committee. And so we won't move forward with this program unless we know for certain that we're doing the absolute best we can for Minnesota. We're building this to be a buy and for Minnesota network as well making sure that the businesses are owned by Minnesotans, making sure that there is a limit on it, vertical integration so we don't have the Walmarts of weed, if you will, coming in and taking over, but also making sure that we're respecting people's desire to maybe not be around cannabis. We're not changing the Clean Indoor Air Act, so you will not be able to consume via a smokable or combustible product inside or in bars. We're making sure that you have um, the rights to uh, have you know, uh, your job and not to lose your employment just because you consumed cannabis over the weekend and then your employer decided to drug test you because we know that uh, intoxication doesn't stay as long as it does in your body. Um, and we're making sure that we can make investments in all of our state agencies. We've had conversations with every single state agency in Minnesota for over two years to make sure everybody is in, included in this conversation. Department of Public Safety, Department of Health, the Department of Agriculture, um, and so many others have contributed to this. We've worked with police and law enforcement. We've made sure that we've addressed you saw how we passed um, uh, civil asset forfeiture was changed. That was in large part because we know that the war on drugs is coming to an end and we can do the right thing to not continue to perpetuate people losing their homes, losing their vehicles, losing their jobs, their children. I've worked with the Department of Human Services to make sure that people who consume cannabis are not disproportionately targeted by child protective services as is the case in some counties today. Um, and really to make sure that we are having a holistic approach. I've talked to thousands of people over the last several years about cannabis legalization, and I understand the concerns. The goal is to bring those concerns to the table and to make sure we have an like a very inclusive conversation about what happens. Um, I have not heard an argument yet that we haven't already addressed. And so I encourage folks to reach out to me via my, my government email because I keep all of those messages and I double check what you say with the bill. I have a copy of the bill here just to kind of give you an idea. I'm going to hold this up. People online probably can't see this, but this is the bill. 
It's one of the largest bills that we have run through the legislature. It's over 300 pages long, and this is just the first engrossment. We're on engrossment number five. So this uh, bill has gone through a number of different committees, and we're having a lot of conversations around it. So I think I'm actually at my time now, so I will turn it over to uh, the next speaker, and I thank you so much for your time today. Dr. George Romuto has a medical degree from the State University of New York Downstate Medical School in Brooklyn. His general psychiatry training was at Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, and then in child psychiatry at New York Hospital Cornell Medical School. For four decades, he was a tenured professor of psychiatry at the University of Minnesota. His clinical work has been with children and adolescents on such topics as child abuse, neurodevelopment, and adolescent behavior. He is a product of Catholic education in New York, and indeed, as he puts it, an unfun fact about him is that he attended the same school as the man formerly known as America's mayor, and more recently known as President Trump's personal attorney, Dr. Romito. Right. And uh, is this the microphone? Yes, it is. Okay. My parish is uh, St. Joan of Arc. So I'm, it's kind of a heretic Catholic parish <laughs> and I enjoy going there. Um, and I'm glad we didn't say that guy's name because <laughs> it makes me sick that I went to school with him. Uh, and uh, many thanks uh, to uh, getting this going and, uh, and inviting us to, to this forum. Um, uh, Michelle, thanks for the logistics. I almost found the right building right off the bat. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's nice to be here at the University of St. Thomas uh, that has added so much to uh, the Twin Cities and the prominence of, uh, of the state of Minnesota. Um, so let me begin. The political, and let me just say, Many of the things that you said, I would agree with. And, and if we're not gonna have a criminal justice approach to drugs, what are we going to do? And I would say there's something different than legalization as an approach. And I'll try to present that. The political conversations about commercialization of cannabis go back several years for me. I was at a DFL precinct caucus meeting eight years ago when an attendee proposed a party platform, let's legalize hemp. And as soon as that was approved by the precinct, uh, the next uh, uh, amendment, the next um, uh, plank for the DFL was legalizing medical cannabis. And that actually was done uh, in 2016, uh, the, the uh, Minnesota Medical Association and the Minnesota Psychiatric Society were both uh, uh, instrumental in getting that to happen. At the time, my wife was the president of the MPS, Minnesota Psychiatric Society. So we were very much in favor of medical cannabis. The next uh, amendment was the commercialization of cannabis. And that also got approved. So the support for these points was strong, and I was really not so, uh, prepared to refute the motions with knowledge from the science of cannabis and what I subsequently learned about the endocannabinoid system, the science part of this. I hope I'm better prepared today and can convince some of you that the insights we learned from the science ought to go into our decision making. Uh, first, before we get to the science, I'll make two brief points about the non-science political issues uh, surrounding cannabis. First, there is a need for social justice and criminal justice reform. What is that number? Anybody know what that number is? That's the number of people in state prison, the Minnesota state prison, and who are there for a felony because of cannabis distribution or sale. It's not a hundred, it's not a thousand. There's about 
8,000 people in our prisons. Half of them are there for drug felonies. That's a couple of thousand are there for drug felonies. That's the number there for cannabis. So if we're moving this along because we have to correct that, well, you can decide whether that's an uh, uh, the balance, whether that will strike the balance that we need to strike. Um, the bill offers a process for expungement for prisoners through a review board. This will be difficult. This will be a difficult task because the prisoners are a kind of a recalcitrant group of offenders. Um, they are there with four other previous felonies. So there'll be a review board and the review board will have to decide whether, whether they should be, their, their um, conviction should be expunged, but they also have convictions for felony uh, gun possession and robbery and assault. And it, it's, it's a difficult group. Uh, of, of prisoners. Um, the number of incarcerated felons for cannabis in Minnesota is low, especially compared to the number of felons in prison for other drug felonies. Cannabis felony convictions are relatively small because the bar for criminal activity related to cannabis is high. Cannabis is not legal, but you can actually have 1.5 ounces of cannabis, and and not uh, and and that's that's okay. That's 42.5 grams. That's 840 edibles. You can have 840 edibles, and still not and and only have a simple misdemeanor. And that's been true since the 1970s. Second, the authors of the legalization bill speak to the need for a policy to eliminate illegal cannabis from the marketplace. But will that happen if it is legal? It didn't in California. It didn't in Colorado, the two states where it is legal and we have their data. Let's look at the legislation of other addictive, sub the legalization of other addictive substances. Has legalization and did the so-called black market for fentanyl. Fentanyl is a highly controlled substance and available by prescription. 70,000 people died from it last year. Availability equates to fatalities. There are illegal markets for Valium and other benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are both legal and the Drug Enforcement Agency controls it. But the illegal market for legal FDA controlled barbiturates, which was deadly in its day and is used in, in some states to, to uh, end the life of, uh, of criminals, is hardly available at all. The pharmaceutical companies are not producing it. It's not available out on the street. When you decrease the availability of barbiturates, you stopped fatalities and you stop the illegal market. The difference among these controlled drugs is availability. Pharmaceutical companies stop producing barbiturates. Criminal deterrents do not work for products that are addictive. That's what we're dealing with here. It's a market of an addictive substance. We did not significantly decrease tobacco use. And that I think is the public health paradigm that we should be following here until it was heavily taxed and resources were spent on prevention of first use and education about health consequences. Each addictive substance requires its own prevention and education specificity. If criminal deterrents are ineffective and radically biased, then what do we do? Is a public health early intervention and treatment a possible approach? Some current treatment approaches, um, some current treatment approaches and insurance-based payments are not aligned with current knowledge 
of the neuroscience of addiction. 30 days treatment for heroin addiction is ineffective. Because it's ineffective, our society says, what's the point of providing treatment for something that's ineffective? Absolutely right. That's the wrong model. We should use a neuroscience-based model. Insurance companies should pay for a neuroscience-based model. Years ago, when kids had leukemia, they would go to children's hospital and get a bone marrow transplant. Insurance company paid for that. Everybody wanted that. How many survived? Only 10% survived. We did it regardless of whether it was effective. We did it because it was necessary. We don't do that with addiction. If a public health and early intervention approach is to work, new models of care must be implemented. Even if treatment standards were to improve, there are larger impediments to managing addictive substances. Issues such as the messages about addictive, substance, addictive substances. Stigma to towards both the addict and the illness are, are um, obstacles. Social and cultural mores are very important in personal decision-making around use of addictive substances. I'll give you one example of how stigma and, and prejudice affect even the medical profession. There was a study that showed, that, that showed primary care docs. They are the people on the front lines, showed those physicians stories um, to, as told by the addicts of what their lives have been, how hard it's been, what craving is like, how difficult it was, it is to avoid addictive substances. Very powerful training uh, approach. What was the change in attitude following this training? <clears throat> the primary care physicians wanted to have nothing to do with the addict or their addictions. There are buprenorphine, very effective medication for managing heroin. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. So if you can't change the knowledgeable people's minds about how to interact around addictions, we have, we have a lot to do to change the mores and social culture and belief systems of our society. All right, the science, this is what I'm good at. Much has been published in the past four years, and it's really, the, the, the science is coming along fast and furiously. That should inform our decisions about the soundness of cannabis legislation. From my readings of the scientific journals and my clinical, because I was the medical director of the state hospital, and personal experience, because my daughter died from an overdose after years of cannabis use, I stand firm on improving the current bill by capping potency at 15% and marking the legal age at 25 years. And here are some of the reasons why I think that. The editors of the American Journal of Psychiatry chose a small handful of special scientific papers that they thought were of exceptional, that they thought were of exceptional significance in 2022. One that is pertinent for us is entitled Long-Term Cannabis Use and Cognitive Reserves and Hippocampal Volume in Midlife. So it sounds pretty technical, and it is, and it's a very good study. This paper followed a cohort of New Zealanders from age three to now 45 years of age. One of their earlier studies that were published from this population so that showed a decrement of one standard deviation, that's 10 IQ points, among adolescents and young adult regular cannabis users. Since brains under 25 years of age continue to develop, this was an expected and, and demonstrates the concern that should be shown for early age cannabis use. This new study 
of individuals average age 38 with mature or completed brain development was unexpected. The study compared regular alcohol and tobacco users to regular cannabis users and non-users and found that among the cannabis users, but not the other groups, cognitive decline continued beyond what was originally recorded, a decline of seven more IQ points. Also, the size of the hippocampus, what's the hippocampus? It's not the other St. Paul campus, it's the hippocampus. The size, which that's where is the site of memory storage, was smaller in the cannabis users. How to understand this concerning finding? Brain, do we have any neuroscientists in here? Okay, then I can practically say anything. All right. <laughs> brain plasticity is a term used to describe the reworking and realignment of brain, of the brain. I offer this an example of brain plasticity. Gabby Gifford, who knows who Gabby Gifford is? Yes, thank you. So she was shot um, at a Walmart in Arizona when she was campaigning. Uh, the bullet went through her language area in, in the left side of her brain. Uh, actually, uh, there was a, uh, her husband is Mark Kelly, who's now the senator there. And he was called and told that she was dead. Uh, she didn't die. Uh, she survived. And, um, but she couldn't talk. She had therapy. She had lots of therapy. What does therapy do? It's a stimulus to the brain. Um, she has difficulty talking now, but she can talk. What does that mean about brain plasticity in adults? There is even brain plasticity in adults. Um, John Fetterman, Senator from Pennsylvania is another example, had a stroke, had lots of difficulties, had some therapy. So we were concerned about people under 25 because their brain was developing. Now we need to be concerned about anybody because, because of what cannabis does to the endocannabinoid system, which influences the synapse. And the synapse is where the neurons connect to each other. That connection has, a, has um, activity. That activity either increases the transmission of information from one neuron to the other or decreases it. When you influence the endocannabinoid system and have THC sit on those receptors, not for nanoseconds, which is what we're doing right now, but for hours, it changes the synapse. It increases the activity of the synapse. So you when we need to wrap up. Okay. So when we when we hear about psychosis and how it's like um, bipolar disorder, it's because that synapse is working so quickly, it looks like somebody's manic. So when I treated patients at Wilmer and tried to use medications that treated schizophrenia, we spent a lot of time and a lot of effort, but we were looking at the wrong thing. The medications we have for psychosis treat the D2 receptor. This is the synapse. It's an entirely different place that has gone wrong because of THC. So I need to wrap up. Uh, I'll just say something about potency. Uh, I think I made, I tried to make my point about uh, 25 years being the legal age. Potency. Um, the, the greater the potency of THC, the longer it spends on that receptor. As it spends its time on that receptor, it influences the synapse and you have long-term problems. Thank you. Give Representative Hansen maybe two minutes to quickly respond to that and then we'll take questions from the audience or, or we can go right to questions from the audience if you'd rather. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. I think these are all really important conversations for us to continue to have around this. So I was just taking notes while you were talking because I, I wanna make sure that I'm responding precisely to that. The first thing I wanna to respond to is the 39. Those 39 people have families. They have kids, they have parents. You know, if each of them has one family member, that's 78 people. If each of them have both of their parents in their life, that's 156 people. If each of them have two grandparents in their life, now we're up to 390 people. All of those people are affected by that. So while there is a small amount of people in prison who do have very complicated criminal histories, none of them should be dehumanized or be considered too lost for us. Everybody can and should be offered a hand at redemption, in my opinion. Um, and we will be making sure that those folks who are in prison have an opportunity by this board to be resentenced in conjunction with the other crimes they've committed because that's the right thing to do. And to make sure that at least their cannabis charge isn't keeping them from their families and our economy and their ability to thrive and live full lives going forward. The DFL platform, I thought that was interesting you mentioned that because that's how I got into cannabis legalization was I became a delegate to our our, our um local precincts there. And that's where I worked on getting the Democrats on board with cannabis legalization. And that's the avenue through which people create change in this representative democracy that we live in, that we go to our local precincts and we do that. When the vast majority of people support something, as an elected official, it's my job to carry that out. If elected officials are not doing the will of the people, what are we doing? That's our job. Over 60%, almost two thirds, of Minnesotans support this. So we've been called by the people to do this. Um, I think the few other things I'll just mention, you know, when it comes to like big pharma and kind of the other kind of classifications of this, the cannabis has no lethal dose in recorded history. There's no rec recorded death due to cannabis use anywhere. And I would, I always open this up for anybody to send me anything that confirms anybody has died from cannabis use. Now that does not mean that people who have died as a result of suicide, other substance abuse, or vehicular crimes or trauma, that that doesn't count, that cannabis may not have contributed to it, but the plant itself um, has no lethal dose, and so it's important. And when we talk about addiction, we have to remember that addiction is and should always be treated in every place in this world as a public health issue. We don't treat cancer as a criminalized issue, and we should not treat can or addiction the same way either. And I think that when we focus on cannabis use disorder as the addiction and the reason for it, we do those people a disservice by not looking at the root causes of why they're using cannabis. So often we see that people who use cannabis are doing it to feel better. And when they're doing it to feel better, why don't they feel good? What's happening? A lot of times we look at this as whether it's their ACE score, their adverse child experiences, we have to start to incorporate that both into our legal process and our mental health and public health options. We have to, because we know that adverse childhood experiences change the shape and the gray and white matter ratios in the brain. Children in poverty have a different brain structure because of the poverty they're experiencing. Trauma matters, and it's important that we keep that there. Um, and so I, th I think it's just really important that if we have people in our lives who are using cannabis at a really high rate that seems problematic and to be causing dysfunction in their lives, that we take it upon ourselves to try to help them understand what is the root cause, what's underlying in that issue. Can yep, I can pause there. Yep. Let, yep. Let's let's uh, bring in, in the audience. Uh, any questions on sure. our audience? Yeah. Yes. So uh, one question I have is that I often hear this cannabis doesn't uh, kill people. And that's kind of what you just said. Have you ever experienced anyone that suffered from schizophrenia or psychosis? Yeah, so I think that's kind of speaking to what I was just talking about, some of the underlying issues, so right? I would make the argument that somebody suffering from schizophrenia or psychosis mm -hmm. is way worse than dying. I don't know if you've ever dealt with anyone that has yeah. lifetime psychosis, mm -hmm. schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And I think it's best if... Um, People that use cannabis realize that could happen to them. Yeah. Our daughter, who is a normal girl from zero to 18, mm -hmm. started using cannabis at age 18. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I remember you coming to our Human Services Committee. So I, I, I recognized you. So I just wanted to say hello. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, it, it destroyed her brain. She, uh, she succumbed to permanent psychosis. And the medication that was uh, 
offered, which was antipsychotics, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. didn't do anything yeah. to help her. Yeah. And her brain structurally changed due to regular cannabis mm-hmm. use. And so I think my question is, if you want to legalize cannabis to help the children of Minnesota, mm-hmm. how do you look out for this unknown yeah. percentage yeah. of people that could have this happen to them? I yeah. guarantee you it's going to be more than 39. Yeah, yeah. And I really appreciate you coming here too to share your story and to both of you. I'm so sorry for your losses because okay. that leaves a mark on you and your lives forever. And I think the concern about what we're doing right now, your voices are exactly what we want in this conversation because it does serve as a warning for other people who may have, whether it's genetic predisposition to schizophrenia or di- or anything like that, and to make sure that we can have quality information available so that kids who may be facing that understand and parents have the resources about how to intervene sooner, right? If you know somebody has a condition, my, my best friend has schizophrenia, so I, I completely like know the day-to-day challenges that come along with it and the hallucinations and all of that. Um, and, you know, he was using cannabis for a long time. And I said, this could make it worse for you. This isn't good for you to be using. It's not to say that this is good for everyone to use. And I never take a position that everybody should use cannabis because of situations like what your family has shared and what was shared here today. And I think that is where we need to make sure the investments in public health are very solid so that we can get that message out broad and wide. And I will say the cannabis bill that was before us that was introduced last year and now had did not have those investments in public health. And I personally have been the one insisting on making sure we do that so that we can have this information out there for professionals, for parents, for kids to all have that real big scope of what's there because the risks should be there. In harm reduction theory, we talk about safe use education. And that is missing. So there's the dare approach of don't use drugs at all. They're all bad. And then there's this harm reduction model, which says we can't really say that nobody's going to use because we know people will. They'll be seeking some sort of um, relief in some kind of way when they're experiencing these really life-changing mental health conditions and brain chemistry uh, conditions. And so if we fail, to incorporate those public health initiatives, if we fail to make the investments in the U of M Public Health Center for Drug Policy and Research that I'm pushing for, I think that this is an area that we will fail in as well. And I'm really not okay with that. I have, I'll just tell you here, I have held our bill back from going to certain places, (laughs) making sure that we can make those investments. And within the last two weeks, I've been successful in making sure that that gets added in because it's important to me. And I don't want your stories to to be- How much is safe, I just ask? I mean, have you done studies? How, how much THC is safe for somebody that's 18 years old to consume? Yeah. What percentage? Yeah. And we don't have that information, which is why I think it's so important that we invest in the research around that, that we have that. That's the good question. We invest here state locally. I'm hoping the U of M, the the school of public health will help us answer a lot of those questions because I think you're right that we need to have that information available for parents. Like I... I mean, it would be nice, but we can't research it until it's legal, <laughs> right? And so it's kind of a heart, cart before the horse. Yes, yeah, so I'll let you answer this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know there's some other questions. There's not a class in here at 1.30, so we can go a little bit past. Oh, great, great. Um, I didn't get my point across. Um, I don't want to brag, but I was the first psychiatrist to publish on the treatment of schizophrenia in adolescence in the world. I was the first one. I, tr- I did a study at the University of Minnesota on the inpatient unit, and I used two medications, and I, I could predict as we were going through the study when, they, when their hallucinations and delusions would remit. It was so predictable. Um, we heard how uh, the antipsychotics were not effective in what was called schizophrenia and psychosis. It's a diff, it's, it's psychosis from a different cause. It is not schizophrenia. It's an endocannabinoid caused change in the synapse. Schizophrenia is a, is a D2, dopamine 2 receptor problem for which the antipsychotics are very effective. This is different and it's permanent. 
And it's not because they were susceptible. There is no, there is no psychosis in my family. There is no psychosis in the family of that man's um, family back there. In this room, there are three people who have lost a child as a consequence of the use of cannabis. It's, it's, it's the number who have died as a consequence of cannabis is larger than this number in this state. So I saw a hand up over here. On the hippocampus, is there any, are there any studies that show a smaller hippocampus and people do to poor nutrition to affect the growth of poverty, they're not eating enough apples or oranges or you know, doing a deep dive into that? Yes, correlation so that's, that's a good question because the hippocampus was smaller in relation to the rest of the brain. So if there was a global poor nutrition problem, the relationship of the hippocampus to the rest of the brain would have been the same. This was, you got a regular brain and then a smaller hippocampus. And then, um, just a quick follow-up. For the states that have legalized, is there any evidence to show that those states' percentage of people using have actually gone up? And what have the benefits been for those states that have legalized? Have they done more research? Have they gathered more information? So what are we so, mean by keeping it illegal? So in Colorado, in Colorado, some of the taxes go for education. $40 million of the taxes go for education. Uh, because Colorado was one of the first states or the first state, it was a destination to, from, to where you can buy your cannabis. And they, they, it was a billion dollar industry. They made so much money. Now there's 21 other states. That, that large amount of money is shrinking rapidly. So if you consider tax revenue as an advantage to, to legalizing cannabis, I guess you could say there was an advantage. In Minnesota, we have had the medical cannabis program since 2016. There are 20,000 people who are on that program. So there are more than a dozen conditions for which medical cannabis, is, you're eligible for medical cannabis. So for those that who, who benefit from it, there is a place for them in the medical cannabis uh, program. All right, let's see, yes. Yeah, just one quick, I guess, clarification question on the study you mentioned. Uh, was there a definition on what they defined as regular use, right? Like regular use of alcohol could be a drink a night or someone who drinks 10 drinks a night. Um, how do they define those parameters in the study? Right. So um, that's that's difficult to do. So you use a community-wide um, test of what the potency of THC is in the cannabis in that community. And that's, the, that's what they used. Um, in, in the New Zealand study, it was about the, the community average was about 12%. So even numbers, but it's regular use. It's, it's potency. And that's, you, you can't evaluate that for the individuals in the study. This was a, this was a um, population study, not a individual subject study. So it's- so Regular use is like every day? Regular use is every day, chronic use, regular use, as compared to, as compared to the way we have learned how to manage alcohol. I mean, let, let's just, let me just go there for a second. When you go to a restaurant, how many drinks do you buy? One. Uh, how many people buy two drinks? Okay, how many people buy six drinks? Somehow, <laughs> some, somehow we have learned 
<laughs> we have learned to drink responsibly. That is the term that's used, drink responsibly. We're drinking responsibly and adolescents have no idea what that means, drink responsibly. Uh, they have to be taught that. We're, we're, we're not teaching anything to anybody right now about how to safely use cannabis. We've got a question back here. Yes, yes. yes. Um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Just, I mean, you bring up alcohol use and there are a lot more deaths and illnesses that are associated with alcohol every year. I mean, it is pretty like a harrowing statistic compared to marijuana. So I'm just curious as like what your stance on that is in comparison to regular use of. So when people get addicted, you know, we used to say things like, what's your drug of choice? As though they only used one drug. Um, it turns out Bureau of Criminal Apprehension looks at these kinds of things. The number of people who use only one drug is very small. People are using two, three, uh, on, a, on a crime scene, two, three, four. They have people who are using, because they test all of them, six different drugs. What is the result of using cannabis and alcohol? Because that's what people do. So the endocannabinoid system has an effect in the liver. What does it do in the liver? When you drink alcohol, you get fatty liver. Your body, the liver attempts to metabolize the fat so you don't go from fatty liver to cirrhosis. When you use THC, it suppresses that. And so you more quickly get to, get to a cirrhotic liver. You more quickly um, get to the point where the alcohol is more dangerous to you because you're using cannabis and alcohol. That's a study nobody's no nobody knows about that study I think but me, but but that was a study in uh, in a in a important, sci an important scientific journal. Yes. No, yes, you. Yes. Um, so I know that I've heard that people say if you have like one glass of red wine, it's like good for you. Is there any way in any capacity that marijuana consumption to an extent could show any health benefits? So for, you know, there's CBD and THC. Um, TA, uh, CBD is not addictive, but I know a lot of people, my sister is one of them who has very severe joint problems, who uses CBD. And there is a study that shows that it has an anti-anxiety effect. And a, and a study that shows it has an uh, um, anti-pain effect. So when the people, so one of the categories to get medical marijuana, medical cannabis is pain. And the choices that those people uh, are have is a combination of CBD and THC. Sometimes the, the proportion is more CBD than THC. Sometimes it's the other way around. If they find something that's helpful to them, they can sleep through the night. So uh, there are some medical uses for it. So, so let me ask a question of Representative Hanson. Um, I, I'm, I'm hearing one area of consensus is that the criminal law has not been a successful mm -hmm. way uh, to deal with this. Um, why not? Why, why not stop there? Why not, you know, decriminalize, you know, the use, the possession at, at any quantity well beyond an ounce, as opposed to moving to uh, allowing it to be commercialized and actually produced? Why, why not draw the line there? Sure, it's a good question because, so my answer would be one, we already decriminalized up to an ounce like we've talked about. And where are we now? It's not working. We're still incarcerating people. We're still having a very active racist system in the second most racist state in the country by, by very important measures of employment, incarceration, and, and income. And we are called the Jim Crow of the North for a reason. 
And so there is an obligation and a public health obligation to make sure that we're addressing racism. The state has acknowledged that racism is also a public health issue. And so that's one piece of it. Second thing I would say is that a regulated market is a safe market. Again, drug dealers don't check IDs. So if we are serious about keeping cannabis out of the hands of children, the best thing we can do is to make sure that we license and hold those accountable who are, who are selling this because right now they're under no accountability. And the laws, you know, like I said, in some counties, you'll get the book thrown at you and in others you won't. That's not fair to the people in that community to have a, a district attorney or a county attorney who has that much discretion. That does not mean that we're equitably applying the law. And I think the last piece I would say is, you know, the, the quality of the product is, uh, is important. We know that we can't control how much THC is in the vast majority of the, of the cannabis in Minnesota if we don't regulate it. We, can't, we have no control over that. We have no control over so many of the things happening right now. So if the goal is to make sure we can control who has access and who has access to what, the only way to do that is, is through legalization with a very strict regulatory framework. Um, one last question. Kate, can I answer? Ahead. Can I, can I say, sure. You, yes. Briefly, and then Kate's last so question. So Zach Stevenson. And others can stay and talk with the participants if they'd like. Zach Stevenson is the author of H, uh, House File 100. I had a half hour with him, and I said, we need a potency cap. He said no. So, so what, what are you to, saying? I can speak to that. So a potency cap is in, is not written into our state law no. because it is within, I can actually pull out the page for you if you're interested, I have it memorized, but um, it is within the Office of Cannabis Management to approve the types of products that are in Minnesota. Anybody here that was born before technology can attest that the weed in the 70s is not the same as the weed today. Why in the world would the government try to regulate something right now that is then going to change again in 10 years. We leave it to the Office of Cannabis Management to approve in there. It's defined as cannabis flower. And as you know, myself as an expert in this area, I said, well, there's only one kind of cannabis flower. So what are you talking about cannabis flower, right? We're writing it that way so that the office will enforce potency limits, but they will do so with the latest empirical research that's available, ideally, from the Center for Drug Policy and Research so that we can continue to make sure that they have the authority to act quickly and fast because the legislature, I can tell you, certainly cannot do that. Um, we are so slow to respond to issues. We need that Office of Cannabis Management to be able to respond promptly. So if we legalize and then the next day some 80% THC potency plant comes out that that Office of Cannabis Management is not restricted by state law of prohibiting that in Minnesota. If somebody comes up with something that they wiggle around our very strict advertisement requirements that do not allow plant or this to be marketed to kids or advertised to kids, if someone finds a way to wiggle around that, that they can act promptly and get that mark that product off the market and deny its ability to be sold in Minnesota. So I understand that you know Representative Stevenson is the chief author, but I'm the number two author for a reason. <laughs> um, and there's, he has he had never even seen a cannabis plant in real life until I took him to a dispensary <laughs> in January. Okay, so I, I, it's important to understand that politics and policy operate in a very um, chestnut checkers kind of way. Um, and he is very skilled at making sure he can do mass negotiations with a lot of stakeholders, which is why he's the number one author, because he adds that. I know my strengths. I know my lane. I knew I needed a good partner in this work. Kate, so you've got the, the last normal question, but again, you can stay and talk with the participants if you'd like. So you mentioned social equity policy within the uh, legislation. You talked about expungement. I'm wondering what those social equity policies look like in terms of licensure for dispensaries mm -hmm. is this like a model where um priority will be given to those who um had previous convictions would it be more of an ownership model where you're looking at at least 51 percent ownership mm -hmm. and also when it comes to tax revenue are there any provisions that funnel some of that revenue back into the communities that have been most disproportionately affected by the criminalization of marijuana this is my absolute favorite question this is my lane <laughs> so i'm really glad you asked it we have a definition of a social equity applicant. If you look at the bill as it stands right now online, I don't love what it says. The model I like the most after studying all the models in all the other states is the New York model, 
they're actually doing a very good job of equity. So I'll be making sure that we incorporate those pieces. We've been in contact with the director of the Office of Cannabis Management in New York to talk about what's working and what's not. Right now, our social equity applicants that are defined as people in certain opportunity zones, there's some you know, hesitation for how we legislate around racial equity, um, and there's some constitutionality to it. So we have to tread very lightly and be careful. One of the other things we're doing is incorporating social equity goals to make sure that we can have a goal to have certain percentages of licenses issued to people who have been most disproportionately harmed, and then also making sure that we have a number of grant programs available to people. So we have five grant programs in the bill right now, one for cultivators, one for a justice initiative, and then three more for business initiatives to help support people who need that capital, whether it's social or financial capital. Um, the tax revenue right now is set at 8%. We just, I disagree with the governor on this one which doesn't happen very much, but on this issue I do, um, he wants double the tax rate. And what we've seen in other states that high tax rates actually don't shut down the legacy market and don't protect you know, kids and who we're trying to protect with legalization. And so we wanna keep that a low rate. The goal of our program here, which is different than any other state in the country, we're not trying to solve our social woes with this. I don't think it's right to try to feed, you know, put it into our schools or whatever like that. We just want it to be a self-sustaining market. And so over time, as that demand for product um, kind of falls off, as we know, and we've seen in Colorado and other states, at that time, I would imagine the legislature will raise that tax revenue to keep that market self-sustaining so that the money that goes to all of our agencies and the office itself are all paid for by cannabis consumers. It's not, we don't want to put this on the backs of all the taxpayers because that too feels like an equity issue. And for a lot of taxpayers, they don't want their tax money going into this. And so we heard that, we acknowledge that, and we want to make sure that cannabis consumers are the ones sustaining their own market. So speaking for myself, I've learned a lot from both of you today. So thank you very much. Maybe this is something that we ought to follow up on in the future and, and do another program. I would love it.